All right, folks, well, thank you for tuning in to one of our ongoing lectures on heart valve therapies. Hopefully, once everyone is vaccinated and we can start seeing people live, we'll have this auditorium filled with people and audience, which would be great. But for the time being, we will do this virtually. So please enter your questions in as we go forward. So with that, I want to give you a little background. Historically, a number of cardiac conditions could only be treated with open heart surgery. But given the increasing age of our population, in addition to the multiple comorbid issues involved, the risk of complications of operating on this population has also gone up. So what we needed to do is we needed medical technology to advance, and it has made leaps and bounds in the last decade. So 30 years ago, probably now 35 years ago, use of coronary balloons followed by stents revolutionized how we treated people with heart attacks. You know, 40 years ago, if you came to the ER with a heart attack, you were given a medication through an IV and was hoping that the clot would be busted by the medication. Nowadays, the standard of care is to actually go in there with a wire and a balloon and a stent to fix those heart attacks because we've found the technology has advanced to the point where it is life-saving. Pacemakers implanted without open heart surgery changed the dynamic of heart rhythm disorders. But the one major area that was not successfully addressed was structural heart, which basically means the valves and the appendage of the heart. So we had some major changes in the last decade. We call it a structural heart revolution, not just an evolution. We now have the capability to address serious internal cardiac issues with minimally invasive techniques. So results with certain procedures have now shown to be equivalent, if not better, than certain conditions with surgical standard of care. And this movement only seems to be gaining strength with newer technologies entering the cardiac arena every year. So there are four heart valves. And tonight, for the sake of time, we're going to talk about two separate conditions affecting two of the valves. One of the valves, the mitral valve, is one of the valves that basically affects blood flow from the left atrium to the left ventricle of the heart. So we're going to talk specifically about the disorder of a leaky mitral valve. This is called mitral regurgitation. So this condition affects thousands of Americans, is vastly undertreated, and basically means the mitral valve has become leaky. Blood spills backwards into the lungs rather than going forward out of the left ventricle as a result of a weak or generated mitral leaflets. So this results in progressive shortness of breath, fatigue, and unfortunately, eventually heart failure and death. So what causes a leaky mitral valve? So if you can see here in the diagram, there's some pictures of the different mitral valves. As you see there on the left where it says normal mitral valve, well, as you move to the right of the screen, you can see that different things can cause different conditions with the mitral valve. If you have a blocked artery or a heart attack, that can cause damage to the leaflets. If you have your muscle dilate, we call it dilated cardiomyopathy or heart failure, your annulus or your mitral valve can actually be spread apart. Sometimes you can have a combination of both conditions. So the mitral valve can be affected by a number of different issues. Additionally, if you've ever had a prior infection of the heart, rheumatic fever potentially as well, these things can cause the mitral valve to deteriorate as well. So the problem is that moderate or severe valvular disease is common and increases with age. So what we notice is that people who present with severe mitral regurgitation are oftentimes not the 25, 35, 45-year-old, but rather the 65, 75, and 85-year-old. What's the problem here is that the, as, old, as you get older, the ability to operate becomes more complex because usually patients in their eighth, ninth decade of life have other conditions that make surgery really not a favorable task to do for any surgeon. The problem though with mitral regurgitation, MR, it progresses to heart failure. So it's a vicious cycle as you can see here that if you have increasing mitral regurgitation, it increases the stress on your left ventricle which leads to muscle damage and loss eventual dysfunction of your left ventricle, 
which then leads to the heart muscle dilating, and then it just begets more mitral regurgitation. And in severe mitral regurgitation, the one-year mortality could be up to 60%. So the treatment. How do we treat mitral regurgitation? Historically, medical therapy followed by surgery, if possible, were the mainstays of treatment. Medical therapy can be effective in mitral regurgitation, especially if it's caused by high blood pressure. That's something we can work with with medications. But the standard of care, the gold standard, is still surgery when there is severe mitral regurgitation. The difference is, though, surgery can be high risk in the aged population. It needs to be done by a surgeon with the skill experience to perform a mitral valve replacement or repair. This is the mitral clip system, but before we go into what the mitral clip is, I'd like to emphasize that, again, a team decision about your mitral disease is important. And what we have at Boulder Community Health are two fantastic surgeons. I consider them not just partners, but good friends, Dr. Mahan and Dr. O'Hare, both of which have done thousands of mitral valve surgeries. But we now have the experience, added experience with Dr. O'Hare bringing robotic mitral valve surgery to the forefront. So when we, have, when we see patients who have severe mitral regurgitation, it's not a one-trick pony show that we have. We can offer numerous different ways to actually fix that valve, whether it be traditional open heart surgery, robotic mitral valve surgery, or the product or the device that I'm gonna talk about right now, which is the mitral clip system. So the mitral clip system is a device that was devised for patients who are too high risk to get a successful open heart mitral valve repair or replacement or robot mitral valve replacement. These patients that we perform mitral clip on are usually the sickest of the group and are usually the highest risk. And the reason why we utilize this is because it gives an, it offers a method to treat people with severe mitral regurgitation successfully. Even though surgery is still considered the gold standard, with patients who cannot get surgery, mitral clip may offer a path. So what is mitral clip? Basically, mitral clip is a device that we place across the mitral valve and actually literally clip the valve and reduce the regurgitation. Now, speaking to you and saying words, it's hard to understand fundamentally what I'm actually describing. So with that, I'm going to play a video. So here in this image, we're seeing the beating heart. And now there's a little bit more of a schematic here to look at the inside and you can see the description of the atrium and the ventricle. So here is blood coming into the left atrium to the left ventricle and it's going out the aorta. This is a normally functioning heart. And now we're zoning in on the mitral valve itself. So here again is blood coming from the top to the bottom and out to the aorta. And as you can see, the left ventricle responds by receiving the blood from the atrium and then pumping it out the tube on the left, which is the aorta. That jet you're seeing there is called mitral regurgitation. So that's what happens when the valve doesn't close properly. It's almost like a little bit of a volcanic, volcano type of a reaction where the blood goes backwards. And here we're showing you where the dysfunction is. On the left and the right, you can see if the leaflets don't co-act or come together correctly, this is where you develop your regurgitation. And over time, from a microscopic level, you see the fibers of the mitral valve get stretched and deformed. So this is the mitral clip. This is not the actual size, do not worry. This is just a magnified view of the clip. It's usually the size of probably my thumb. And this is the device that we deliver the, the, the device through. So the mitral clip actually is inserted 
in the vein in the leg, the common femoral vein. This is done under general anesthesia with guidance with the ultrasound with usually a cardiologist or anesthesiologist. We then cross from the right side to the left side, and that little puncture is not felt by the patient, nor is it any consequence after the procedure as the body will heal it up. We then introduce our catheter over the wire, and then we insert our mitral clip. So our device is then inserted into the left atrium and actually controlled, and I can control the movement of it up or down, left or right. Once we like our position, we will open up the arms of the clip right above the jet, the largest jet that's there. We then introduce it across the mitral valve, and then we close our arms. If we do not like the position, we can assess our position and either release the clip or re-grasp and release the clip's arm and actually move it if needed. So in this position, we decided to move it a little bit more medial, try it again, and we look and see, and at this position, we like it, so the clip is then pulled back and is now a permanent implant in the heart. And the goal is to reduce that mitral regurgitation to a non-significant level. Moving forward, let's talk about a different valvular pathology. This is aortic stenosis. So we just talked about mitral regurgitation. So you should think about a leaky valve is regurgitation. What is stenosis? It's a valve that doesn't open. It's a valve that basically is shut tight or becoming shut tight. So we're gonna talk about aortic stenosis, which is a different heart valve and a different pathology with the stenosis. So aortic stenosis can be seen earlier in life as a congenital issue. You can be born with this, and oftentimes it's called a bicuspid valve, which means you have two leaflets, but it can also be seen as age-derived. That means we can see patients in their 70s and their 80s coming in with a heavily calcified aortic valve that does not open. That being said, please keep drinking your milk. Don't worry, take your calcium supplements. Your dietary calcium intake has no bearing on how an aortic stenosis valve progresses. Calcific aortic stenosis was a very, is a very real problem, but more so when I say in the Florida population, because that's where I came from before I came to Boulder. So I saw a lot of the aortic stenosis patients and actually was really aware of the lack of treatment for these patients because they were elderly. So results in closure of the aortic valve, which causes progressive chest pain, lightheadedness, passing out spells, will eventually lead again to heart failure and death. So we know the prevalence of aortic stenosis. It can be up to 7% of the population over 65, and it's more likely to affect men than women, and 80% of adults with symptomatic AS are male. That being said, I'll tell you the truth, I treat probably equivalent women and men, and I think it's because we're becoming better at diagnosing more patients. So the demographic that 2% of the U.S. population over 65 has it, and nearly 30% of the population has something called sclerosis. That just means there's some scarring of the valve, and sclerosis oftentimes leads to stenosis over time. So what causes aortic stenosis? The most common is just age-related calcific stenosis. So again, it's, an, it's a consequence of getting older, and a consequence of there's more disease developing on the valve. Rheumatic fever can also cause it. And of course, what well, you mentioned, a congenital abnormality if you're born with a bicuspid valve or of something of that nature, you can see aortic stenosis develop younger. So risk factors, increasing age, male gender, high blood pressure, smoking, some blood markers like L LPA and LDL cholesterol. To be honest, none of these have shown to be a one-to-one -one ratio to you know, matching up with aortic stenosis. So realistically, the best thing to diagnose aortic stenosis is your history, 
and the physical exam, followed by a simple test called an echocardiogram. But first, let's talk about this. This is a very important slide, and I think anybody watching, who are my, any of my patients watching, will understand when I have said to you many times, how do you feel? And oftentimes, patients will say, I know I have severe aortic stenosis, because that's what the ultrasound said, but I feel great. Well, why do I keep asking then how you feel every time you see me? Because you can see the curve. Once symptoms start, there's a rapid downhill decline. So when it comes to aortic stenosis, it takes decades to get to the severe level. But once it happens, we really need to keep a close eye on how you feel. Because the main issue is, once you start having symptoms, as you see in this slide, they become rapidly progressive. And then the muscle starts fatiguing, and then you have more or less higher complication rates trying to fix it. So we're not saying that everybody with severe AS should be fixed today, but we certainly don't want to say in a year either. We want to know within that span if symptoms develop, whether it be fatigue, tiredness, lethargy. Just imagine if you can't do your day-to-day -day activities like getting the groceries, walking the dog, going up a flight of stairs, that might be your valve as opposed to just age. So sobering perspective. Severe inoperable aortic stenosis has a worse prognosis than a number of normal, normal well-known cancers, lung cancer, breast cancer, prostate. So severe inoperable AS is a condition that a lot of surgeons know is critically uh, lacking in the sense that their patients have a negative outcome by undergoing open heart surgery. But if you catch patients early in the process when they're just getting symptomatic, aortic valve replacement greatly improves survival. The problem, the low percentage of aortic valve surgery. And the reason why I state this is because, again, a surgeon, any surgeon, would be hesitant to take someone who is, say, 90 years old with multiple other medical conditions and subject them to an open heart procedure knowing full well they may not make it through the procedure. This is something we have lived with in the medical system we have for the last 50 years until the last decade. So open heart surgery becomes riskier with the older population. Need for longer hospital stays, rehab, treatment of comorbid issues. But the last 10 years, we've seen a revolution in aortic stenosis therapy. TAVR, transcatheter aortic valve replacement. In Europe, it's called TAV with an I, which is transcatheter aortic valve implantation. Just different semantics of saying the same process or same procedure has become a viable technology for treating aortic stenosis. So what is TAVR? It's an aortic valve replacement as an alternative to traditional open heart surgery. And it's less invasive than traditional open heart surgery as well. This slide is a little outdated. It says three TAVR options, but the one on the bottom, which it says Boston Scientific, that valve was actually taken off the market last month and is not available. But luckily, the valves that we utilize here at Boulder Community Health are the two valves that you see on top there. The Edward Sapien valve and the Medtronic core valve are the two most widely used valves and actually are the only used valves now in the US. And again, we utilize both of these valves. I'd like to talk, though, about specifically about the Medtronic core valve. Because one thing I will tell you what we've learned, and I've been doing TAVR procedures since 2007, since I was trained in fellowship. I will be honest, we are finding out that the valve you put in, they're not all equal. You would like to try to put in valves that have larger sizes. So each patient may be individualized, obviously, and you have to do that. But for the Medtronic core valve specifically, it has such excellent results from multiple studies from both approved valves, but the recent core valve data, which is the Medtronic valve, have shown better results in high-risk patients, even the ones compared to surgery. So we're actually seeing a technology that doesn't rival surgery, but it is actually better than surgery in high-risk patients. So what's the drawback? Why doesn't everybody just get a TAVR if they have severe aortic stenosis? Why are we doing open-heart surgery? Well, the reason is there's multiple reasons to get open heart surgery. If you have multiple blocked arteries and a severe aortic stenosis, if you have a dilated aorta, if you have another valve like the mitral valve, which is leaky or tight as well. So open heart surgery absolutely has a role 
in every patient that has severe aortic stenosis to be evaluated. Hence that when we see a patient at Boulder Community Health, not only do I see the patient, my partners, Dr. Mahan and Dr. O'Hare, will also assess these patients if it's determined TAVR versus open heart surgery is the right therapy. We have a question with this new technology, and everyone always asks, which is very important, how long will this valve last? That's a great question. We don't have more than eight-year data out currently because this technology has only been around for 10 years, but the good news is we do have that eight-year durability data, especially for this Medtronic core valve, and it's actually quite good. So we are feeling quite confident that when younger patients are coming to see us for a valve replacement, we know we can put in a valve that at least has somewhat equivalent durability to the surgical valves. So in summary, heart valve disease is growing in the U.S. population. We need alternatives to standard surgical therapy for patients who are at higher risk for complications. And both TAVR and MitraClip represent the forefront of these therapies, but they will not be the last. That being said, I want to show everyone the video of what a TAVR procedure is. And again, here we have the beating heart. And we're looking at a different perspective now. We're looking at the aortic valve, which is the valve that connects the heart to the aorta, which is the biggest artery in the body. And as you can see here, they've aged that valve. And now you see how it's not opening as well. And that white material, that's calcium that's been deposed on the valve. So during tablet procedures, we do not need general anesthesia. We can oftentimes use some local lidocaine for the groin and have our anesthesiologists provide some minimally invasive anesthesia. And we enter an artery in your leg, usually the common femoral artery, but if we cannot go through the leg, we can actually enter in an artery in close to the arm called the axillary artery or even the carotid artery. So we have done all of these successfully at BCH. So this is the most common route though, is the femoral artery. We place a wire across the stenotic valve and we deploy this valve. Now, if we don't like the deployment, we can move it and here, we go ahead and deploy the valve. And because everything in the heart is under hemodynamic pressure, the valve works automatically. There's no need for sutures. There's no need for electricity. It works immediately. So right in that instance, we can put a new valve in less than an hour usually, and it's fully functional. And oftentimes, patients will say to me, well, that's great. Putting a new valve in through my groin is wonderful, but what can you do to prevent a stroke? And that's an important question because, to be honest, we didn't have an answer for a couple of years, the early years of performing TAVR. And we realized there was a need because stroke risk is definitely a real thing when you're putting a valve across a calcified area. There's always a chance that a piece of calcium can break off and go places you don't want it to go. So at BCH, we also utilize something called the Sentinel Cerebral Protection Device for every TAVR case. This is a way to prevent plaque, clot, or anything else to going to the brain while we're doing these procedures. So initially, we put in a pigtail catheter. We advance from the wrist a device called the Sentinel Cerebral Protection Device. You can see there's a filter in one of the main arteries leading to the neck. And the other filter will then go into the left carotid artery. And these filters are there throughout the case. So then, once the case is done and there's an example of plaque or calcium that may break off, it's caught in the filters. And the end of the case, we go ahead and recapture the filters and the device with all of the substances in it. And we then remove it out of the wrist and then close the wrist.
So with that being said, I'd like to open the floor up for questions and to say thank you for watching. Thank you very much. We appreciate this, and we're going to go through some of the questions that of have been offered. Mm -hmm. And we want to uh, remind those that are watching to feel free to ask questions in the chat box to the right of the video. We'll try to get to as many as we can tonight. Um, so let's just get into this. The first one is, what causes a heart murmur? So the question is, what causes a heart murmur? So this is actually, it's a basic question with a very complex answer. A heart murmur can be caused by hundreds of different things. It can be from disruption of flow across one of the leaflets of the heart or valves of the heart, which is, whether it be the tricuspid, pulmonic, aortic, or mitral. It could be something called an innocent murmur where we hear that in children oftentimes, which is nothing to be concerned about. However, if you are someone who's a physician or a mid-level PA or a nurse practitioner has heard a murmur and you haven't been told that before, it's worthwhile then to follow up with that. Whether it be seeing a cardiologist or getting an echocardiogram, there's no downside with making sure that murmur is in a sign of a leaky or tight valve that's developing, even if you are asymptomatic. Thank you. May TAVR be helpful in treating aneurysms and ascending aorta? So the interesting question is, can TAVRs help with ascending aneurysm or ascending aortic aneurysms? So unfortunately, no. At this time of 2021, there is no endovascular or minimally invasive procedure to treat ascending dilated aortas. We can put in catheters and big uh, stents really in the descending aorta and the abdominal aorta. But when it comes to an aorta that's coming off the heart, because of the coronary circulation that's right there, there's no minimally invasive way of treating those types of issues other than open heart surgery at this current time. Have you seen any COVID related problems in people who have had TAVR? So we have not seen any COVID-related infections or morbidity associated with any of the structural heart procedures that we perform at BCH. That's nice. <laughs> what happens if the mitral valve clip falls off? Is that even possible? So the question is, what happens if the mitral clip fall, uh, falls off the leaflet? Well, let me tell you something. I've seen it. I've actually been through this where it doesn't fall off the leaf, both leaflets usually, but it'll fall off one leaflet, and we call that a single leaflet detachment. That usually happens is if the mitral clip itself hasn't been positioned in a perfect area, or the mitral valve leaflets have some different dis distinction like calcium or something on it that would make the mitral clip not hold on to it. This was early on, maybe seven, eight years ago in my career, starting with the mitral clip, and I can tell you I've learned a heck of a lot. And not only did I learn, the company that manufactures mitral clip have learned and changed their whole uh, program. The mitral clip itself has gone through major evolutions. So the, the likelihood of seeing a leaflet detachment or seeing a leaf, uh, the clip fall off is extremely low, less than the 0.1% chance if it's deployed properly. So again, it is definitely something we all think about prior to deployment, but currently with the new technology, things have been minimized tremendously. Can you speak to insurance coverage of this procedure? So insurance coverage of both procedures that I've talked about tonight, TAVR and MitraClip, are FDA and CMS approved, which means Medicare will cover them without a problem because they are not investigational. This is not one of those study uh, devices where we do off-label. As long as you have the condition that meets the criteria for these devices, insurance will cover it 100%. Is mitral valve regurg correlated with aortic regurg? Is there a multiplier effect? So that's interesting. Sometimes with aortic stenosis, 
you can see worsening mitral regurgitation because the blood doesn't get out the heart and it goes backwards across the mitral valve. With aortic regurgitation, which is a leaky aortic valve, we usually don't see that exacerbate mitral regurgitation for the main reason that blood is still coming out of the heart, it just falls right back in because of the leaky aortic valve. So there's not as much pressure buildup across the mitral valve. But that being said, there are a number of patients we see on a day-to-day -day basis that have both leaky aortic valve and a leaky mitral valve. Not saying they both need surgery, but oftentimes if there's surgery done for the mitral or aortic, the surgeon will often repair the other one as well. Why not do these procedures before symptoms start, assuming you know that trouble is coming? So this is a question that everyone in the world wants an answer to because everyone has stated, well, heck, if we know the end result is going to be heart failure, why don't we stop the train before it crashes into the mountain? This is the issue. We have 50 to 60 years of data, at least of the pathology of aortic stenosis. And in the old, I would call it the older days when surgery was the only thing we could do, we found that watchful waiting actually wasn't, wasn't that bad for a lot of these patients because surgery could result in a negative outcome. There's an ongoing study currently that is basically randomizing patients who are asymptomatic with severe aortic stenosis to getting TAVR versus observation. It's ongoing as we speak. The risk, of course, by doing an asymptomatic patient is, remember, these are procedures. There's always a risk of a complication doing these procedures. So before we offer asymptomatic aortic stenosis patients TAVR, or even open heart for that matter, we better be confident in the data and the outcomes. As long as we know that it was worth doing the procedure and we can minimize risk, then I think it will be something we will offer people in the future. But we need the research first to prove that doing asymptomatic patients will make their quality of life and the duration of life better than if we did nothing at all. Are there cow or bovine aortic valve replacements? They're both. So basically we have both TAVR valves and they use cow and pig valves. So the truth is both valves, both the Edwards and the Medtronic valves, are excellent and they've proven themselves, but they do utilize different types of animal tissue, both pig and cow. Also, if a mechanical valve is used, does the patient need to take blood thinners? So the question is a mechanical valve. And a mechanical valve is a surgically implanted valve. There's no animal tissue whatsoever. The mechanical valves have an awesome track record, as in you can have one in your 20s and live with the rest of your life. What's the downside then? You have to be on Coumadin or blood thinner, also known as warfarin, for the rest of your life. It may be easy if you're a 25-year-old or a 35-year-old to say, hey, I don't have any problems taking it. The problem is when you get into your seventh and eighth decade of life, people tend to bleed from all sorts of places in the body. And if you are on one of these medications and you basically have a mechanical valve, you cannot stop taking it. We see it oftentimes where a patient comes in in their 70s or 80s who may have had a mechanical valve when they were younger. They started bleeding when they're in their seventh or eighth decade. What are we gonna do? If we take them off the warfarin or the Coumadin, they may thrombose their mechanical valve, but if we keep them on it, they're having an active bleed and we don't know how to really treat these patients. So it's really a difficult decision because we know the valve is really durable. It's the downside is the lifelong blood thinner that you have to be on. If you have mitral valve prolapse, are you at risk for valve disease? So inherently, if you have mitral valve prolapse, you do have mitral valve disease because prolapsing of the mitral valve is not a normal phenomenon. But that being said, just because you do have a prolapsing mitral valve, which just means a valve that kind of bows backwards, it's the best way to describe it, it does not mean that that valve needs to be replaced or repaired. But however, if you do have MVP or mitral valve prolapse and there is any murmur or symptoms associated with it, follow up with your cardiologist and regular echocardiograms is usually very important to assess if there's any progression of disease. Do bicuspid patients have greater aneurysms or heart issues? 
So the question is bicuspid valves. So bicuspid valves are typically in the aortic position. It's normally a tri-leaflet valve. A bicuspid just means two leaflets. It's a condition you're born with. And yes, if you have a bicuspid aortic valve, patients tend to have a more dilated ascending aorta. So there is additional pathology associated with bicuspid aortic valves. People who have bicuspid aortic stenosis tend to be younger. We tend to see them in their 40s and their 50s as opposed to people with calcific aortic stenosis who present in their 70s and 80s. And oftentimes, people who have this type of bicuspid aortic stenosis do have a dilated ascending aorta, which is also an indication usually to have it surgically fixed. So the valve and the aorta can be repaired at the same time. Okay. So someone has been diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension. Does this fall into some of what you've gone over tonight? So pulmonary hypertension means an increased pressure in the lung fields. Now pulmonary hypertension is not just one thing. It's usually caused by multiple issues. It can be caused by COPD, asthma, sleep apnea. But when it comes to the heart, it can be caused by backflow from the mitral regurgitation or aortic stenosis. So both conditions can result in elevated pulmonary pressures if untreated because of the backflow of the blood back in the lungs makes the lungs work harder to pump it back out. Um, is there a risk or what about uh, blood clots after these procedures? So the risk of blood clots after getting a TAVR or a mitral clip is actually incredibly low. Hence why we do not place patients with these, with these uh, procedures on any potent blood thinning medication. The indication to go on blood thinning medication after a procedure like this would be if there was a mechanical aortic or mitral valve placed or if the patient has underlying atrial fibrillation and arrhythmia of the heart, those are patients that would go on blood thinners if needed after these procedures. But normally, if you receive a TAVR or a mitral clip, you will not need to be on Coumadin, Eliquis, or Xarelto. We utilize baby aspirin and another medication called Plavix, which is an antiplatelet medication, and that's only continued for a few months after the procedure. Okay, great. Can TAVR replace an aging por porcine valve? So the question is, can TAVR replace a previously placed surgical valve that wasn't mechanical? And the answer is absolutely yes. So we routinely see patients now coming back in their 70s and their 80s, even younger, who had an open surgical valve placement when they were younger. It wasn't with a mechanical valve, it was with a bioprosthetic surgical valve. So another valve that has cow or pig tissue in it. Over time, those valves go bad, which all bioprosthetic valves do. So what we have done now in medicine, if for patients who are at higher risk for open heart surgery, we will put a TAVR valve in that old surgical valve as a replacement. Okay, I think this is the same question, but I'll leave it to you. Uh -huh. um, can TAVR replace an already replaced valve? Correct, so it can replace only a bioprosthetic surgical valve, not a mechanical valve. So if you have a mechanical valve and you're on Coumadin and you say, I don't wanna be on Coumadin anymore, I wanna have a TAVR, the only way to get that is to have someone take that mechanical valve out, and in which case we wouldn't do TAVR, you would get a repeat open heart procedure with the bioprosthetic surgical valve. Um, what happens when TAVR fails? So what happens when TAVR fails? So this is where the, I would say, billion dollar question is. What do you do when this area of stenosis develops? Well, luckily, we have now gone to the point, or unluckily if you want to call it, but we have now putting TAVRs in a TAVR that may have failed. So we are currently going in that direction as well, where if a TAVR does not work, you can actually put a second TAVR in that position. Okay. Um, if diagnosed with uh, the regurgitation with aorta and mitral valves, do you agree to wait a year for another echo and see if anything progressed? So normally, this is a patient individualized decision. There's no blanket statement to say if you have leaky aortic and mitral valve, you have to wait a year. But it does come down to how bad is the leak, 
is it stable from your prior echocardiogram? So there's no blanket statement that can be made that it has to be one year. I oftentimes, if I see anything changing on an echocardiogram or symptoms change, I'll repeat an echo within six months. So again, it comes down to your decision making with your doctor. So what about doctors? How, do you, how does someone get a second opinion? Uh, someone had been told that they need open heart surgery for mitral valve stenosis. So a second opinion, honestly, comes through your primary care doctor or your cardiologist. And if your cardiologist has an issue with getting a second opinion, then do your homework. Get online and see where you live and look up the nearest medical center around you other than where you're going and ask to see if you can see their surgeon or a cardiologist there. I think there's no downside to getting a second opinion because again, it's your body and you wanna make sure that you're getting the appropriate care. So someone is um, on the young side, they're 54. They were diagnosed with mild mitral regurgitation two years ago. Uh, when should they ask to have this revisited? I would tell you, if it's been two years since your mitral regurgitation has been diagnosed, today, I would say get that repeat echocardiogram and reassess. Because again, it wouldn't be just for the valve, it would be looking at your risk factors. At 54, are there other issues we have to look at, like your blood pressure? Are there other things like cholesterol that need to be examined? So this would be another way to round off every other risk factor that may be involved. So if you've had it two years ago, I would suggest getting that echocardiogram and follow up with cardiologists now or soon rather than wait any more time. Okay. If you have pulmonary hypertension, is it considered a death threat? Well, I'm not sure if pulmonary hypertension is ever a death threat. Maybe you're thinking death sentence, but uh, the truth is with pulmonary hypertension, it is a multi-variable condition, as in multiple things can cause it. So with pulmonary hypertension, it really comes down to the discussion with the pulmonologist, the lung specialist, when it comes down to primary pulmonary hypertension. Secondary pulmonary hypertension, which may be caused by valve disease, different discussion, because if you rectify the underlying condition that caused it, even if it's sleep apnea for that matter, you can get better. Okay. What's more worrisome, a bicuspid aortic valve or the aortic stenosis? Well, bicuspid aortic valve should not be worrisome. The worrisome issue is the end product of all these uh, etiologies. If you have stenosis, aortic stenosis, that is a concern. Having a bicuspid aortic valve should not be the concern if there's no stenosis. So I would tell you, stenosis is the key issue here. Okay. What is the timeline in making an appointment with you? I'm happy to see it. We add on patients daily, literally. So we don't have the policy of one month wait or none of that stuff. We are opening our office daily to any valvular heart patient and to be honest, any cardiac patient. So to see me in the office, less than a week. Perfect, thanks. With a bicuspid aorta valve and two ascending aneurysms, when and what surgery will be recommended? So the question is with the, is that two ascending aneurysms? I'm sorry. I didn't yes, just... a bicuspid aorta valve and two ascending aneurysms. Right, so there's really hard to tell you what two ascending aneurysms mean, usually just one large ascending aneurysm. So there's cutoffs that are in the guidelines of stating when to have your valve and aneurysm repaired. Again, there's blanket statement guidelines that say if you reach 5.5 centimeters of your ascending aorta or your valve is less than one centimeter, those are indications for intervention. I would caution you on the guidelines. I think this has to be individualized. So if your aorta is 4.2 a year ago and now it's 4.7, that's enough for me to tell you. I think we need to do something about the aorta. I don't have to wait till 5.5 because it's, it's definitely growing. So this is opinions of these types of conditions you need to make with your cardiologist. Okay. Does elevated cholesterol have any effect on valve disease? Well, we feel that elevated cholesterol can definitely be a risk factor for aortic stenosis, and we know it's a risk factor for coronary artery disease and vascular disease, so there's not a downside to treat it. If you have high cholesterol that's not being treated well with diet and exercise, I absolutely feel confident that you should go forward with some medical therapy if you can't control it with the normal methods of diet and exercise. Okay. 
Okay. We have a, a viewer who has mitral valve stenosis, and they wanted to find out, is there a regime or therapy they can do to improve their health? So mitral stenosis, especially if it's from rheumatic fever as a child, is a difficult condition to treat with anything that I've described today. There's really no method of putting a valve in the mitral position that has mitral stenosis that is currently approved. You know, in, there were times where we would put a balloon in the mitral valve called a mitral valvuloplasty, which is done for people with purely rheumatic mitral stenosis. However, the older you get, the more calcified these valves do get, and these procedures aren't necessarily the best bet for long-term therapy. So at this current stage, severe symptomatic mitral stenosis is treated with open heart surgery. Okay. Have you addressed a mitral valve prolapse with regurgitation on a person who also has HHT? So I have not personally have had to deal with a patient with HHT and mitral valve prolapse especially with the age group when these patients come in. I will tell you though, when patients do have these conditions, oftentimes we will involve our other co-specialists, not just our surgeons, but if there has to be hematology involvement as well, obviously we need to make sure to ma minimize bleeding risks because there's always a chance when you're doing procedures on patients who have other conditions that you might run into other problems. So before you actually get on the table, it's important that we get everybody together to kind of huddle together and figure out a plan. With the mitral clip, would that prevent AFib? So the mitral clip has no effect on preventing or creating AFib. The mitral clip is specifically to reduce the leaking of the mitral valve, and that's its main purpose. Perfect. We have a, a little lapse and some questions coming in. So is there anything else you'd like to speak of in terms of what a person can experience during this time of COVID coming into your office? Correct. So at Boulder Heart and BCH, from a global perspective, we have impeccable safety precautions in place. I, I'm proud to say that uh, we have kept going throughout the pandemic treating our patients because, again, just because COVID is out there, you know, a lot of patients still have mitral disease and aortic disease. And we're, I'm proud to say that we have treated these patients successfully and have not had one negative outcome due to COVID before or after our procedures that we perform on these patients. So it is something that we take very seriously and I really would like to ask everyone to get vaccinated if you are eligible. But that being said, in the last six months when the vaccine was just coming out, we still kept doing these procedures and I'm proud to say we did it safely. Thank you so much, Dr. Iyengar. I believe we may close our program now unless we get a few more questions coming in. And my colleague, Karen, may uh, say a few closing words. Um, where I'm gonna, let's just give just one minute for a couple more questions to come in. Okay then. We do have one more question. Mm -hmm. My 20-year-old son has bicuspid valve. We were told three years ago that it is functioning fine at the time. What would, you, what would be ongoing care? So normally with someone who has a normally functioning bicuspid valve and has not had stenosis or regurgitation, generally once every five years you can get a repeat echocardiogram. If, though, the echocardiogram does show any dysfunction, whether it be leaking or stenosis or dilated aorta, we would move that up to probably every year or earlier, depending on the pathology. 